Hi everyone and welcome to today's session. So today we'll be talking about how do we get a good representation of your input data. So this is a very interesting topic for me because I'm very interested in how memory works, how memory can be restored and retrieved and used in applications such as large language models. So the representation of how the memory is stored is actually quite important because it kind of dictates what is retained like how much compression do you do? And also like what, when you retrieve it, how different will it be from your initial uh, storage? So this kind of representation forming has been done for decades. I mean, the field is called representational learning, okay, but I'm not going to touch on the details of that. I'm just going to share with you how I feel representational learning could arise naturally using next token prediction or next state prediction or so on and so on. So, um, first up, let's take a look at how representation is like traditionally done like in the past. All right. Okay, so this is the aims of today is to find a suitable representation to perform decision making. All right. And this representation can also be the basis of how we store memories. So this is the autoencoder representation method. So what an autoencoder does is like you have your input, like let's say your pixels over here. You want to represent it in a space such that it is compressed and low dimensional so that you try to squeeze the relevant parts of your image into like very, very simple bits that can potentially generalize across like other instances. Because if you were to store it as just pixels like that, the chance of this exact same amount of pixels repeating is quite low because you can have another image like four that you just vary it slightly. The slope of the four could vary a bit slightly and it's a different image already. But in the representational space in the middle here, if you do like a compression, you could actually store both of the fours like in the same kind of region, All right? So this is the hope, okay? If we do some kind of autoencoder, we hope that our representational space in the middle can potentially represent like similar classes together and you know like you have another set here like for number three and so on so again Lacun likes to call this the manifold where you just store the in this manifold here you have your different regions being separated and yeah this is done also in, in the hopes of um, generalizing so at the end of it if you want to go back to your output you kind of need to express this manifold and map it back into a set of pixels. So like, for example, this pixel number four, you go back to this four here again, like what you see in this image. So one big problem of autoencoder is the loss for the autoencoder is typically done at the input level. So we don't do losses inside this latent dimension here. Our loss is compared between the input image and the post output generated image, which means that the loss is typically something like mean squared error of pixel values. I mean, you could also do like a mean squared error of something else, but typically you compare in the input dimension, you are prioritizing output clarity, which means that you want to repeat exactly how the output would be. Like this four over here, I cannot like have another four that, that looks like this that will give me like quite high loss because the pixels are different. Okay, but in actual fact, this might be actually the right manifold over here in the center. So by doing the autoencoder loss, prioritizing the regeneration to be almost exactly the same as your original input, I don't think this is the way to get the right latent space. Okay, although it's been done by a lot of different architectures, autoencoders, variational autoencoders, even some form of GANs, they have also do some form of like reconstruction loss, or like cycle GAN, that kind of stuff. So I don't think this is the right answer, although this has been done very extensively because the objective function is wrong. You are trying to reconstruct the original image. You are not trying to split them nicely in the latent space. Like over here, this is the latent space here. You're not trying to make like partitions of the latent space whereby similar like classes group together. And this also does not naturally disentangle well in the latent space because 
there's no objective saying that, okay, I should disentangle like sharp edges versus curvy edges. You know, I don't have to do that kind of feature kind of disentanglement. In the middle, it can be just a block of, of random statistical mess. And then hopefully you can reconstruct back based on this statistical mess using this Z here. So this disentanglement is a huge problem in representational learning, and it's not naturally found in the objective of an autoencoder. So these are some of the reasons why I don't think generating back the original image, or if you're talking about audio, generating back the original audio, I don't think this is the right approach to do it. Okay. In fact, when people like to say, we have war models. We can generate what comes next in the world. Like if I move my hand, I can predict where my hand would be exactly in the next moment of time. I don't believe that's the case. Because for you to have an exact pixel vision of where your hand would be, you will need to go through this kind of autoencoder reconstruction loss. And th that is, that doesn't like, in my opinion, okay, of course, this is highly subjective. This doesn't give you the right latent space because you do not, do the disentanglement, you do not do the grouping by classes in the middle. You are just prioritizing reconstructing your pixels exactly. So again, uh, Lacun uh, did an experiment with GANS before he used GANS to predict uh, the position of cars on the highway. And he said that the GANS prediction is very blurry. So more specifically, let me give you an example that he mentioned in one of his uh, lectures. You have this pencil, okay? And then for this pencil, when you drop the pencil down, all right, the pencil can go in any of the 360 degrees over here. So if you were to predict this pencil dropping, what you will end up having is you will end up having a very, very blurry picture of a pencil because the pencil can drop in all kinds of directions. And in order to minimize the mean square error based on any one of these directions, you have to be a blurry block across all possible futures. So this is what we prioritize when we do this kind of mean square error loss. It, of course, if you condition it on some latent variable, like maybe let's call it A, you condition on some latent variable A, you might be able to predict exactly like where, where the pen, pencil will drop. So of course, this means that you need to have a latent variable that is expressive enough in order to account for like all the future possibilities. Okay. But I don't think that's possible. Yeah, instead, I believe that we do prediction of the world model using some form of extrapolation of our memory fit to the current situation. So this is my hypothesis. Uh, these are just some of the views that people have in the past. I'm just giving some example. So yeah, any questions uh, for this before I move on to my next slides? Okay, so this is what I want to just highlight that this is probably not the way to get your representation, all right? Next, we need to ask ourselves this question. When we want to predict like the next state of the world, do we need to predict everything exactly, all right? So you see this autoencoder, you want to get the next pixel, everything of the next pixels exactly right because you are doing like pixel loss. But when you're driving along the road, you know, like going to drive, do you actually predict like how the leaves, sorry, do you actually predict how the leaves move? What direction the leaves move? Like imagine you're a driver of a car. Do you predict how the leaves sway with the wind? Do you actually do that kind of prediction? How the bird flies in the air? Uh, maybe you do that because like the bird might hit your car. But most of the time, what we are interested in, we're just interested in this car here. Where is the next position of this car? Where is the next position of other cars coming to be? Right, because we are only concerned about what can affect us in the driving. So the prediction is not for every single thing. Okay, we don't predict every single thing. We are just predicting things that matter for our decision making. Like for example, this self-driving car here. Uh, I mean, this is for self-driving cars. Okay, but over here, these are manual drivers. Okay, if you are a self-driving car algorithm, you don't care about how the leaves move. You don't care about how the birds fly unless the bird is going to hit the car. What you care about is what other cars are doing, what your own car is doing. So you have very, very constrained prediction that is only related to your outcome of your actions. Okay, you don't really care about how the rest. Uh, of course, the other thing that we need to predict okay, is also the curvature of the road. Okay, So this one we do quite well when you drive. Okay, If you drive, you realize that you can actually steer and then you can follow the curve of the road quite well. We predict the curve quite well. 
So these are the kind of things that we predict well. Okay, we don't really predict everything else well. So the fundamental nature of how we represent things, okay, we have to reconsider again. Should we do this kind of autoencoder loss? Because autoencoder loss encourages you to remember your input exactly. You have to remember the same set of pixels forming this floor. Okay, you cannot really like disentangle them in the latent space that well. You can't express them well in, in the latent space in the middle because you need to remember all these features here. You can't forget. And I would like to say that actually forgetting is very important for learning because if you forget away the more detailed features, if you forget like how the leaves sway, a lot of things can fall within the same state. A lot of things can be grouped together. Like you can see me talking right now. If my head is on the left a bit or my head is on the right a bit, I'm still considered the same person because like I'm still me. So if you were to pixel by pixel construct back, reconstruct back my face again, you will have a very different representation for my face being on the left here and my face being on the right here. Okay, so I'm just trying to say all this because I feel like the auto encoder kind of loss is, is, is bad. <laughs> it's really bad for representation. So how do we do it then? How can we do prediction without doing the reconstruction loss? How can we get the representation without doing reconstruction? So this is what I think the reason why transformers work so well, right? By performing prediction on the next token or the next word or so on, like transformer, you give like a certain word here, like for example, I am a cat. I am a blah, blah, blah. Okay, assuming that your tokens are at the character level. So you can predict like maybe cat with 0 0.9 probability and man with 0 0.1, okay, assuming that you are a cat, all right? So um, this is okay, this is the, the way like we try to train the model such that given whatever you have seen before here, you try to form a most plausible output here, all right? That matches the context, the background of what you have seen earlier. So this kind of representation, you have no need, okay, you have no need to reconstruct back your IM. Uh, this one, you don't have to, no reconstruction at all, no reconstruction needed. What you do instead, you are just predicting the future. So this predicting the future kind of thing, it's something that is touted quite a lot in neuroscience. Our brain is normally said to be a prediction machine. We try to predict what goes on next. And if something happens that is out of our prediction, then we'll be surprised. So transformers seem to do that quite natively because by predicting the next token, you sort of form the right representations of your earlier tokens here. These earlier tokens will go in through here, through self-attention and so on. All right. And uh, cross-attention if you do the encoder architecture here, because you have cross-attention here, okay, of like the key value, key value query. Yeah, like that. Yeah. So if if you were to think about it, transformers actually take in the current state and tries to predict the next state without reconstructing the current state because you have no need to. Right. So this is something quite powerful. And more than this autoencoder loss that we saw earlier here, more than this kind of loss here, what we encourage, okay, we are encouraging the transformer to to form structures and representations of the world in the previous structures. So for example, you can ask like a transformer like that. Um, a is the son of B. What is the father of B, uh, of A, something like that, yeah. So, or who is the father of A, sorry, yeah. So if you have a blank over here, assuming you have like question answer data sets like this, you can actually learn stuff like father-son relationship, like, for example, if you talk about symbolic representation, you can have A, okay, this actually is B, all right, B, okay, and then down here will be son of, and now here will be A, and then if you go by reverse the trend here, this one will be father. So by predicting the next token successfully in this kind of like question answer data sets, we are sort of learning a structure of the world. So people have done experiments on GPT. It can function quite well as like database. You, you store something in, you retrieve it. Is this in the database? Is that in the database? You form the representation of the database just like that. 
Yeah, and if you do like code, like for example, um, if, if you do like maybe Python code, like define x, y, z, okay, then the, some variable here, like then you do something like return, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so usually like this thing will be related to some form of the variable. So by doing this kind of prediction of the next token, you force the transformer to learn the structure of a function. So you learn the structure of a function. If you talk about larger code, you learn the structure of the entire code. And this all lies implicitly by just doing next token prediction. And it's a very, very powerful means of forming the right representation. So you might be asking me, like in the transformer, where do I think the representation lies? Right. Actually, the representation lies in every level because you do cross it, um, you do like iterative self-attention. But the what I feel is that this embedding space here, because of the back propagation of the embedding space, your embedding space is the representation learned. Okay, so if we learn this embedding space, we can then use like you can then flip the kind of context. So next time if you see a sentence like this, okay, so this is A is the son of B, right? So now let's flip it. We do C is the son of B. Who is the dad of, of what? Uh, of C. Yeah. So, so if, if we do something like that next time, okay, you change father with that, but, but the representation of dad and father is the same because, like, if you look at the corpus, dad and father appears like in, interchangeably. So you will learn that these are the same. But if we were to do something like that, you can see that transformers are very good. And like something called what I call copy and paste. <laughs> like they can actually mix and match certain contexts with another context. And you can get the right answer like over here, which is D. Okay, even though in the training set you may not have encountered the word C or D, you can learn all this. So the way that is done over here is that you can already represent all this in some form of embedding space, the tokens in the embedding space. And by just learning this embedding space here through next token prediction we are essentially doing generalization because we can generalize to sequences of texts that is like not seen before. But because you already know how the embedding space is, you can do this kind of like novel zero shot or few shot learning, right? So this is really, really very powerful. Um, to be honest, I was skeptical with transformers, like whether next token prediction is enough. Until I saw ChatGPT, then I realized that if you scale this method up, this actually works. All right, later I will give some insights of, as to why I think it can work hierarchically also. Yeah, so this uh, will be shared in one of the later few slides. But I uh, just want to highlight that doing prediction to learn representation is very powerful because you can learn the structures of your data as well. Can I pause here for a while? Uh, any questions so far with this slide? Okay, no problem. Uh, we can discuss more at the discussion later, but let's move on. So another good thing about like how the transformer architecture can work okay, is that it can do self-supervised learning very well. And one of the, okay, let's maybe just talk about supervised learning and, and unsupervised learning. So like supervised learning, okay, you have from the input here, okay, you have your inputs and then you have like labels over here, Y. So you provide X and Y, inputs X, labels Y. Right, that's supervised learning. Okay. So you is quite intensive because you need to kind of do the manual labeling of your of, of your data set. So if you're talking about unsupervised learning, okay, you are just like taking in X. And then what you're doing is you are just giving like some form of like, like embeddings of your X. So so this is unsupervised learning is typically done like this. You have a few classes and then you try to group them using some of some form of clustering so you can like cluster this data points together but because they are, they are in, in the same region in the latent space and you can classify this data together so all, all, all this here is you are just providing and then we form clusters to aggregate similar x without knowing why so this actually can form quite good representations if you look at unsupervised learning, all right? But one of the key breakthroughs, I feel, powering all this AI wave right now is this self-supervised learning. And this is actually what Yen Lukun was advocating. So self-supervised learning, I mean, in the open AI paper, they call it unsupervised learning, but actually it's more like self-supervised learning. What you do is you take in X, okay? Where X is your inputs. 
and you just do like x plus one or something like x maybe x t x one to t maybe x one to t and then you get x t plus one over here so this way of self-supervised learning is something like this the cat set on the so the answer is met okay but you already know the answer because you are just simply taking the token in this case the word that comes in the corpus so like the corpus could be something like that the cat sat on the mat, the dog sat on the floor. So you already know all this. So you're just truncating the corpus and predicting the next word of the corpus. And by doing so, you learn the structure of the corpus without even needing any labels because the labels come from the data itself. So think about this. Uh, Yen Lekun mentioned that like human babies, they observe the world for maybe one to two years, then they perform actions. Yeah, actually, that's not really correct because my kid can walk at one year old. So obviously, they need to be performing actions at a one year old. And even at like when they are born, they suckle. So all these actions are already done. But um, what I'm saying is that you can learn a lot by just observation alone. Okay, provided that you actually do the actions also. So so okay, this is a bit counter to uh what Yen Lukun is saying. So Yen Lukun is saying that you can just observe and learn everything. I'm saying actually you need to do an action. So in the case of like me observing like that, what's my action? My action is to do nothing. Because by learning that do nothing, and you can see the world move like that, it means the world moves independently of you. But if I know my action is I move my head left, I move my head right, the world might shift. And I know that it's because of me. So the action is very important. You need the action in order to ground your observations so that you know what is what happens because of you and what happens independent of you. That's very, very important. So for the case of LLMs, you might be wondering, you know, where's the embodiment? Why is there no embodiment and it can still work so well? Because for LLMs, the action space is the next token. So this is quite um, counterintuitive because I'm saying that for language, you can do an action by predicting the next token purely just in your head. You don't even need to move at all. Yeah, so this is quite different from robots and embodiment because if you do robots, you need to feed the robot with the action sensors of itself so that it can distinguish between its own movements versus the world's movements. Okay, but for next token prediction in large language models, you don't even need the move, uh, you don't even need to feed the action signal of, of the robot. Okay, because the action that is doing is to predict the next token. So if you treat the LM as an agent. Okay, so let's just draw the agent diagram. If you treat the LM as an agent, okay, this agent takes in, what does it take in as observation? It takes in past tokens as the observation. Past tokens. And the next action that it's doing is doing the next token. Okay, so actually this is a uh, part of the paper that I'm, I'm writing next. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to say uh, action is all you need. <laughs> action prediction is all you need. Okay, because if you can predict like what your next, next action is doing, or right, if you can predict what your next action is doing, you can actually know how to form your representation of the world because the representation of the world is grounded in how you move and how you interact with the world, right? Uh, okay, let me talk about this psychology experiment also. Uh, this is quite interesting. I don't know the source of this, but you feel free to, to Google and find it out. So um, there was once this neuroscience experiment about two cats. So you have cat number one. Let me just let me just show you the cat. Okay, uh, maybe I'll just clear this whole thing because you have cat number one, all right? Let's call it cat A. Okay. I know my drawing of a cat is not very good, but just bear me. Cat A and we have cat B. All right, and these two cats, one of them is pulling a lever. Okay, one of them is pulling, pulling a mechanism, right? That is actually connected to the other cat. So the other cat is on a wing scale or on a platform. Okay, so this cat is on a platform that 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 doesn't basically the cat doesn't need to move. The cat will be rotated around the, the room, but this cat is actually walking. So the room is a circle room. So it's like it goes one round like that. And another round like that. 
And on the walls of the room, you have like stuff like stars, circles, squares, and so on. And there's one exit door here. Like this is the door for exit. So in this experiment, okay, what the researchers found out is that for the cat that was moving around, all right, the cat that was moving around, this cat A, after going around the room a few times, the cat was able to navigate to the door, to the exit. Okay, but this cat B over here, the cat B was unable to navigate to the door, all right, because this platform moved independent of the cat. So the cat doesn't know how to like, this is my theory, okay, the cat doesn't know how to disambiguate its actions versus what the actions of the world are. So this action is very important because if you can predict like how your action will affect the world, you are essentially predicting like the structure of the world. Okay, this is a very um, interesting statement. Of course, um, this is not, uh, I, I would say this is not validated by science yet, but I'm quite certain that action prediction is the key for the success of large language models. And for the special unique case of large language model, the action is the next token. But when we talk about embodied robots, the actions will then be the how the robot moves and so on. So th those are the kind of actions that we are talking about here. Okay, so this self-supervised learning works Okay, even for states and actions. Because what you can do is like this. You have a state one, you take action one, you go to state two, all right? This is reinforcement learning, by the way. I mean, these are states and actions. Uh, I, I omitted the rewards because I don't believe that rewards are essential for modeling this. Okay, so if you look at my fast and slow paper, I try to do away with, reward, re, do away with rewards. All right, so this is what um, happens. And what you can do is for self-supervised learning, you can just take in this one, state and action. And then you try to predict the next state. Okay, but this is naive, okay? Predicting the next state like that is bad, okay? Because state is hard to predict. Okay, what I propose to do, okay, is instead you do this, right? You have your starting state. I feel like I'm, I'm okay, so this is quite interesting because I'm actually doing the research for this right now. So. If this works out, it'll be quite cool. If you have your starting state here and your ending state here, you take these two states here and you predict the action. Okay, why I say you predict the action? Okay, so you do prediction of action. Prediction of actions, given start and end state. So by doing this action prediction, we are learning better representations of the state, all right? So for the case of the large language model, the state and the action, I mean, in this case, the action is the state itself also because the action is the token itself. So if you look at the transformer graph behind, what you realize is that you can actually have the, oops, sorry. If you look at the transformer here, what you realize is that the output for the transformer is actually used as the input. So let me just draw. Output for this transformer is actually used back here as the input again. So we talk about the transformer output as an action. The action will then be the next state because all these are the states, like the earlier states here. So in the special case of the transformer, the action is used as the state. Okay, but what I'm saying in the more generic robot case, you can actually use self-supervised learning to learn the representations of how the states are. And then in so doing, make learning much faster because you can just learn from any stream of experience. Okay, so uh, what, what you're hearing now is a, uh, Fresh off the oven, my paper should be out soon. Yeah, so I'll let you know when when it's out. Yeah, so um, let, okay, let's let's stop here for what. Uh, any questions so far? I I got quite uh excited talking about this. That I exceeded the time a bit. But but any questions on this so far? Uh, so when you when you say you when you so when the agent is um, itself is involved in in the environment. So its own action actually affect the environment. Um, why do you say that predict next state is difficult? Oh. Um, yeah, because I think in the typical RL uh, framework, you can think of predicting the next state basically is learning the transition function, right? And uh, there are quite a few RL methods actually, if I remember correctly, TD is TD learning is to learn the transition function first. Yeah, uh, can do Q learning also, TD learning and, and so on. But I mean, for states, usually for images, you need to process using some image model like CNNs or ResNets or vision transformers. I mean, you, you name it. 
yeah, so, so there's this form of, um, like you need to do some form of compression with this uh, image models. But if you want to do the reconstruction of that image model again, it will be something like that. You have a very high dimensional state space. And if you want to predict the next state here, you also have a very high dimensional state space here. So the high dimensional state space is intractable for prediction because there's too many possibilities. I, I don't think pixel, um, I don't think pixel representation is the right representation for images or so, but I'll talk more about that when I cover vision transformers next time. Okay, I have another plan to do images, but uh, let's let's just um, focus on today's thing. What I'm saying is that images are not a good thing to predict because there's too many possibilities. Like you have each pixel, each pixel has a lot of, um, like you look at this, each pixel is 255 red pixels, 255 green pixels, 255 blue, and 255 uh, maybe like transparency, yeah. So you, you have like 255 to the power of four possibilities for each pixel. And that's like humongous. Like you look at the number of tokens you have in Transformers, like even GPT-4, yeah, I don't know about GPT-4, but like GPT-3, you have maybe like 80,000 tokens. Yeah, this is way more than 80,000. This is like at least like quite uh more than twice that. Yeah, more than 10 times, more than 100 times. Yeah, so it is very hard to predict next thing if it's an image. Okay, I see. Yeah, but whereas if you talk about actions, how many actions can you have? You move your muscle up, down, you know, you can discretize your action space. Yeah, this is maybe another time I can talk about it. I I feel like discretization is very important for prediction. If you don't discretize it, you predict a continuous value, it's very hard to predict. Yeah, but if you discretize into discrete classes, it's much better for prediction. Yeah, we can talk more about that on another session, but um, this is just some of the ideas I have. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Any other questions regarding like what I talk about, like the self-supervised learning, like helping to predict? I mean, having to form representations. Um. Hi, John. I had hi. a question. Uh. Yes, um, So, yep. when you say um, the action prediction is all you need in the sense that if you have the start state and the end state, and you're able to predict the action, you have a good uh representation of the state itself. Uh, can you explain why that? is something that's true like why is action prediction leading to a good representation of state okay so um let's give uh some, some form of hypothetical because i don't have the results yet but this is what hypothetically is let's say you're in a maze where your state one and state two are like cells and this is your action one which is like going right okay so the let's say this this cell is zero one or zero zero and then this one will be like one zero because like you move let's say the first is the x-axis okay and then you you talk about another set of cells like maybe zero five and then you perform the same action a and then you get like maybe like one five okay let's say this is the representation of your of your movement to the right so this is the action to move right and the state is represented by x y okay move right means increasing x by one so this is the moving action. So if we learned that like given this start state and this end state, okay, the prediction is action A. So, so what this means is like that start state will be like 0, 0. End state will be 1, 0. And action will be A1, all right? So this is the first set of... Uh, Oops, it's a bit jumbled, but yeah. Then if you have another one, start state is 5, 0, 5. End state is 1, 5. And then what will happen is that we have the action again as A1. So what do you learn from these two predictions of your start and end state and predict the same action? You learn that this action A1 is probably responsible for this one, increasing x by 1. because um, based on this start and end state here, the commonalities between both of them is that you move your x to the right by one. So the next time, if I do this action here, like knowing that this um, next state gives you action A1, all right, what I can then do, okay, this one is something that I, um, I'm still thinking of. I'm even thinking this action can be represented in the same dimensions of the world, like some in some space of the world, which then can be something like that. So you can actually learn the embedding for your action as well. So next time when you want to do like um, 
find out the next state, you can then use the action itself to like do vector addition and then you get the next state. So like, it is a bit more advanced than I wanted to cover because I haven't really finished the experiments yet. So I'm not too sure whether this works, but this is my theory, like everything, okay. Remember, uh, I don't know if you all have seen my previous thing about memory as reference points plus movement. Okay, that's my theory. Memory is a reference point plus movement. In this case, the reference point I'm talking about is the starting state of the memory. And the movement that I'm talking about is this action here. So I believe that all states and actions, like even if it's reinforcement learning, you can map as a vector. And then you can do like vector movement. Okay, uh, but there's a caveat, okay? Because I said state is intractable, right? How then do we like do just vector movement and get this new state? I mean, that contradicts my own point, right? So this state over here that I'm talking about, this state is already like not the main representation. This state must be some form of abstract representation. If not, you cannot do this vector addition inside. Uh, because like the original input space is intractable. You can't do this with a, tra a tractable kind of action space. So this state here must be a dumbed down version of the original input. And you probably cannot construct back this state space back to your original input. You probably can't because you already lose the information. Yeah. So yeah, this is uh, my theory. Yep. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. No, don't worry about all this. Uh, when I finally finish the experiments, I will do another video on this. But uh, I'm just saying that the main point I'm trying to say is that self-supervised learning works very well. It helps you learn the structures very well. And it does so without even human data. I mean, you can just take the data off the web. You don't have to give like human annotations. Sorry, not, not without human data. It's without human annotations. And I forgot to go through this thing here, but this thing here is just saying that if you have like two different classes, by doing self-supervised learning, you can learn the distinction between the two classes in the latent space. If you have four classes, you also ideally can learn the difference between like the four classes. Like for example, if this A is like English speaker, B is a Chinese speaker, C is um, like Malay speaker and so on. So, so you can actually learn to distinguish by just doing mixed token prediction. Or if you were to link back to the reinforcement learning I was talking about earlier, next action prediction can distinguish between the representation of your states and actions. Okay, it's just that for large language models, everything, every action is also a state because the, you are predicting the next token. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. I got quite a lot to cover. Okay, so next, I'm going to talk about this thing called the Japa architecture, joint embedding prediction architecture. And this actually by Lacun, Yen Lacun. So what uh, Yen Lacun is doing for this is that it's actually very, very like similar to what I talked about. You have an input space X here. Right, and you have uh, output state y over here. Okay, but you don't predict like x condition on a certain action like z. You don't predict this directly, so you don't predict, don't predict input to, uh, don't predict current state to next state directly. Okay, instead the prediction is done here. The prediction is done over here. The prediction is done in the latent space. So let me just draw that out here. Okay, and how is this prediction done? Okay, this prediction is done by firstly doing some form of encoding to get you the latent space. And this encoding is, is, is common, okay? The way you um, like encode this into this space here, let's call this the abstraction space because it's consistent with my memory framework. Okay, so this is the abstraction space where then you can form um, like relations between your, your inputs in this abstraction space that is consistent. That means the same action will give you the same outcome in this abstraction space. Okay, you don't go to the pixel space, you go into some representation that is consistent. Okay, and what there's a lot of things that he did here. Okay, one thing that he did was to use this thing to, uh, it's called uh, mutual information. Okay, and this mutual information is basically saying that Okay, I want to make sure that this SX, okay, has as much information as possible. Like this SY has as much information as possible. So I try to maximize the amount of information this abstraction space 
contains so that I can use it for prediction. Next, you okay, remember I talked about the pencil, like if you push a pencil, um, if you don't give it some form of like external wall action, like the pencil fell on the left or action fell on the right, what you end up is you have to predict a blurry block of where the pencil went to. So in this case, in uh, his Japa architecture, the Japa's architecture's information content is represented by the environment. Uh, environment's information is represented by Zach. And we try to give as little possible information about Zach as possible because if your Zach is too much, you could like, give the model answer through Zach, which is the like what the environment does. Okay, we don't want this to be too much because we still want to learn the relation between this input and output. So here, what we do is our prediction is here. We predict, okay, based on the current state, we predict the next state. Okay, and this is our prediction of the next state in the abstraction space, SY. And what we want to do here is this part here. We want to minimize the distance between the predictions. Okay, minimize prediction error. So if you talk about my um, state action framework, how do we map it here? The state that I'm talking about, like the initial state S1 will be here. The next state S2 will be here. This prediction here is action one. All right, so the action itself is the mapping from state one to state two. And this mapping is in the same vector representation as your state one and state two. You can do the same kind of mapping of where the action is. So this is actually quite similar to like what I was thinking about, um, but there's quite a few key differences. Uh, the key difference is I don't believe that um, you need to do this mutual information minimization. So if you look at Yen LeCun's papers, he talks about this thing called VicRec, variance, invariance, covariance regularization. So VicRec, okay, uses like, you take uh, an image, you transform it in two different ways. Like one is like rotate left, one is rotate right, but it's the same image. Then you do like some form of a contrastive loss to make sure that, you know, both of them are, the representations between these two perturbations are invariant. Yeah, so uh, this, this is big rec. There's three different losses, the variance, um, the invariance between the two representations and the covariance between the like the dimensions of the uh, embedding space. So it's, it's quite um, complicated. You can go and take a look at the paper. Um, but I don't think uh, using variance and covariance or this is actually correct because if you talk about like probability spaces here, like you talk about variance minimization or this, it's a bit hard to learn from it. Like I don't, I don't really see like how you can learn from something that is like very, very like distribution based. Uh, I mean, I could be wrong, but I feel like this information content part should not, um, uh, should not be a loss function. It should be a heuristic. So it's like getting from here to here. Okay, it should be a heuristic, or it could be learned separately. Okay, but you don't learn this end to end because it's a bit too hard to learn all this end to end. Because if you change your encoding here, it's like changing the extraction space, your prediction will also change. Your prediction error here will change also. So if you want to learn this encoder, this is my view, okay? This is my view. <laughs> the encoder here, encoder is learned separately. Or could be innate biases. Okay, so this is what I feel, okay? And this is something that I believe like we haven't got this right yet, but this Japa kind of prediction where we predict in the latent space is probably correct because we cannot predict in the input space. We have to predict in the latent space. Okay, how does this link to transformers? Okay, you might be asking me, how does this link to transformers? Uh, in transformers, the latent space is the embedding space. So in transformers, this encoder is embedding space. Yeah, and then you do the prediction, which is like the next token prediction, okay? And yeah, that's mainly like what you see over here. You can also do like minimize prediction error by minimizing, uh, by basically maximize the probability of the next predicted word here. Yeah. Okay, I have a question here. Uh, who's asking? Simon asks, uh, why can't we predict in input space? Is it due to having too many dimensions? Okay, so this is a good question. And uh, as what I mentioned to Terry earlier, if we were to do the prediction in the input space, and your input space is something like a picture, there's like 255 to the power of four possibilities for each pixel, which is like close to a billion. I can't remember. You can calculate, yeah, 255 to the power of four. And then you have each pixel, you have one 
um, different value, right? If you want to do that, you will need to predict like every single pixel accurately. And that's just not possible. Mm -hmm. it's, it's too much to predict. Yeah, like if I were to ask you to predict like how a bunch of balls on the pool table would end up, you know, you also cannot predict that amount of like, okay, maybe you can if you are a pro pool player, but you know, I'm just saying that there's a lot of information that you need to predict and you can't possibly um, do it that well, right? So if you want to do the prediction in your input space, you will necessarily incur a lot of like, messy prediction because like I, I i i think it's very difficult to predict an image like what happens next in the image like yeah if you look at the one of the first few slides here you will see what i mean like in order for you to predict this four to this four here you necessarily need to memorize quite a lot of things because each four is different like some fours are like that some fours are like that yeah, you know, if you want to predict exactly this four to this four, you need to know exactly which translation it is, how many pixels from the top, how many pixels from the bottom, you know? That is very messy. And it'll be much easier if you could just like predict in the latent space where the latent space tells you like how many strokes there are, maybe it's three strokes. Yeah, so, so something like that. So if you can do an abstraction space whereby the problem is simplified, you can predict much better. I hope that answers the question, yeah. So does this mean that um, you will also need a decoder to translate your prediction from the latent space back to the input space? Yeah, yeah. so this is my point. You don't do that. So um, if, you, if you think about it, like humans, do you remember like your memories being very clear? Like not really, right? Normally it's very hazy. So yeah. my hypothesis is that the memory is like this abstraction space. It's already stored in a very, very low dimensional space. And if you want to map it back to the real world, like, how we how we view things, um, it's just you can you can do some form of like like because if you store it in the middle here as like oh three strokes each of this connected to each other here, once you map back here, your four might look like this. Okay, which is very different like in terms of the shape from the actual one, but it captures the semantic meaning of your four very well. Okay, because it's still a four. Yeah, okay. so I'm thinking that there's no need to map back to your input. You can just do all your prediction in your latent space or in your abstraction space. Everything can be done there. And you will still have a perfectly functioning decision-making agent, although you cannot map back to the input. Okay. Yeah. So um, this also goes to mean uh, to show that like I feel like okay, this is another time, but I, I feel like the way we do our image like reconstruction loss for different kinds of like you know, do the masking of like cat dog you know like you do, you do the segment mask or this i feel like maybe um that's great for computer application software but that's probably not how we do yeah, that's probably not how we do prediction or that's probably not how we do decision making we don't go back into the segment mask so what i'm saying here is quite radical because almost the whole field is mapping back to the input okay but i don't agree with this approach okay so more on that on another session when we talk about vision transformers, I'll be sure to let you know my displeasure with vision transformers. All right, so so you will you'll hear that soon. Okay, so let's let's move on. Okay, uh, yeah, just check. Okay, okay, okay to move on. I, I know it's a bit heavy for this if you haven't heard of Jaffa before, but um, so far all, all good. Just one, just one comment. I think recently Yana Kun mentioned in one of the podcast interview of him uh, saying that he no longer believes in contrastive learning. Oh yeah, I also I also agree with him. <laughs> okay, so I mean, the reason is because if you want to do contrastive learning, you need to have positive and negative samples. So this is like, let's say, I've drawn a very, very lousy version of the manifold. But let's say if you want to learn the manifold between the data and this manifold looks like this. In order to learn the data well, okay, you need to know what lies on this manifold and what doesn't lie on the manifold. So it will work well if your dimension is low, but if your dimension is very high, you need like exponential amount or, or polynomial amount of samples needed uh, with respect to dimension in order to distinguish between what's on the manifold and what's not on the manifold. So if you do contrastive learning, you need to select your contrastive pairs. Like you need a lot more contrastive pairs to learn this manifold here. Yeah, and that's why he believes the contrastive learning is bad. So I, I agree with that because if we talk about like, if your abstraction space here, 
I call this abstraction space, okay? People call it latent space, but like, let's just call it abstraction space. If your abstraction space is too high dimensional, your contrastive loss is, have, is going to have a hard time to map the right manifold. Yeah, that's why he said that he doesn't believe in contrastive loss. Yeah, and and I, I'm actually um, with him on that. Yeah, uh, is, is that okay? Yeah, it's just, uh, just one comment. Yeah, but I mean, if you talk about like contrastive loss, you realize Hinton is very keen about that. He talks about the forward-forward algorithm. He's also talking about positive versus negative samples, um, layer-wise training. Yeah, so he believes that like in dreams, you you form the negative sample. Because I was in Europe, so I listened to his talk on the forward-forward. Yeah, he believes in dreams, you come out with the negative samples of your life so that you don't overfit to the positive samples of what you see. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the contrastive loss um, thing that Lacun was mentioning, you would realize that you don't actually, um, this actually is very inefficient because like, if you want to have negative samples, you need to have like a lot of negative samples and positive samples for like higher dimensional data. I mean, the fault for he did on MNIST. So I think it's still still quite simple, a data set. But if you were to do it for more complicated I, I data sets, I can foresee that uh, that might be a problem with finding the right negative samples. Yeah, so this is just food for thought. I mean, that's, I, I mean, I'm not saying that this is a bad architecture. I'm just saying that like, this is related to contrastive loss. And you know, if we cannot get the contrastive loss to work for high dimensions, then this might be bad. Okay, but the other approach is you can do contrastive loss on low dimensions. So another form of research could be to find the representation, you could make Okay, you force latent or abstraction space to be lower dimension. Then maybe um, contrastive loss might work because if you force it to be low dimension, then the contrastive samples you need won't be that much, won't, won't be that many. Yeah, so um, I mean, this approach will work if we can artificially limit the, the space that we are like doing the contrastive loss on. So yeah, I think there might be some hope for this method if we can do something like that. But uh, as of now, what I'm uh, inclined to think is that like you, I actually like the idea of making the abstraction space low dimension, it, but I don't think contrastive loss is the way to go because it's just like, you, you just need a lot of samples. What, what I'm thinking is that we actually do some form of like next token prediction in order to learn this manifold. So let me just write this down here. So instead of using contrastive loss, we do just next token prediction to learn this manifold. I think that works better. Yeah, which is actually quite similar to this, right? You, 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 this is like next token prediction. Yeah, so this, this architecture I think is, is okay. Just that you cannot use this kind of stuff. Like what is variance regularization? I, I think that is that's very hard to quantify. Yeah, that's very hard to learn from also. Like if you put in all these losses here, you know, if you do regularization, like L1 regularization or L2 regularization, it dilutes this thing. It dilutes the prediction error, which is the main error that we need in order to, to do the representation learning, in my opinion. If we put all this information content, this all this can dilute the, the main source of signal here. So I would rather not put this regularization in. I would do this encoder thing here, either separately, you learn this pathway separately, or is fixed. Yeah, so I'm inclined to think that it's innately fixed. Okay, later you can see some of the later slides. I'm saying that the way we represent the input space into this abstraction space may already be fixed. Or it could be like, um, like for example, long-term memory only comes after three or four years. Maybe you, you take three or four years of your life to find the right embedding space. And after that, it's fixed. Yeah, so... Uh, again, this is all my theory. Um, no scientific proof for that, but I'm quite curious about like how memories, um, like how this embedding space is formed for memory. Uh, I mean, just to share with y'all, I'm like reading a lot of neuroscience textbooks now on memory. I think that is the key for the next wave of AI advancements. We need to figure out how to store memory, and the the way to store memory is not 
in pinecone embeddings. Yeah, that's just a very artificial, naive way of splitting the memory. We need to find the right way to do the abstraction. And yeah, we haven't found that out yet, in my opinion. Okay, uh, let's move on. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, it took a while. But uh, did that answer the question? What was it? Sorry, you asked. No, 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 not just question. Uh, just one comment. Not really a question. Yeah. Oh yeah, that, that that I think that's in line with the comments. Yeah, we can talk more about this. I have a feeling that I won't be able to finish this today, but we can spill over the rest to the next week because it's a very interesting topic. All right, so next up, I'm going to talk about this. Uh, this is called World Models. Okay, and this World Model is actually it's called Dreamer V2, but actually Dreamer V3 is the same architecture also, just more complicated. But I'm just going to talk about World Modeling. All right. And uh, before I begin with more modeling, I'm going to say that uh, uh, I, I don't believe in it. Let me bracket here. <laughs> but I'm just going to talk about this for completeness. So earlier I talked about like how you can predict like maybe the next states. Okay, you see over here, what they are doing is they are trying to map back the... So this part here, like you are talking about prediction of the states in the latent space, I think this is okay because like this, this is in line with like how you can find the state and the action embeddings and then you can move from state space to like you can form like state one and then you form an action one like that and then you go to state two. So I think all this is okay because like and this state here is the abstracted space. So like maybe I just put a star here. Okay. So this is a uh, action mapping between states in abstraction or latent space. Okay, maybe I think I should use it as H instead because like and in this diagram is, is known as H for the latent space. So I do believe like this is actually quite similar to Jeff Do you think so? Like this, you have an encoder here, okay, which will encode it into, okay, sorry, it goes into Zach. So Zach is actually your latent space. So it goes into your Zach. Okay, and what happens is that you then compare after you apply like a certain prediction here. Okay, in the latent space, you then compare like this is your predicted output, like maybe Zach 2. You then compare like this Zach 2, how different it is from your actual Zach 2 of the next state. So this actually is doing next token prediction or next state prediction. And uh, they use a very smart way of doing it. Um, instead of doing like a continuous value uh, latent space, what they did is they did categorical values. So with categorical values, the benefit is like this. These are all one hot encoded. So this categorical values could be like, um, like maybe the category could be, I, I don't know what's this. This is a car game, is it? How many cars? So maybe one of the category could be how many cars. And then like, this could be the classification. This could be zero. One, two, three, four, five. I mean, and if you shade here, it's like there's one car. So this is could be one representation of like how you could do your categories. And then like maybe another category is like, like where is the player? Where is player? Like, then you could talk about like player in the zero row, first row, second row, third row. And um, this is this is very good because um, these categories help to disentangle. So I, I, I quite like this categorical um, latent space here. Uh, what I don't like is, I don't like this part here. I don't like um, doing this thing here at the top. Let me just cancel it out just to express what I don't quite like about this architecture. I don't like this thing at the top. And of course, I don't like the reward also because <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking that reward actually helps to like dilute the objective. The objective here is trying to do next state prediction or next token prediction. In this case, the token is your latent space. So you can also do your next like state prediction. Okay. Um, but because the state space is so hard to predict, like this is the latent space for your state. Okay. What I'm thinking is that this thing from here to here, this could already be learned. Okay, this is fixed. So this is my theory. This is fixed or, or learnable only at the start. Then fix. Okay, so this is uh what I think it is. Right, so I, I don't think you need to learn this, like um, how to represent this state. This is already given. 
right? It's like your memory, like your is already given. What you need to learn is how to map your actions to your memory. So it's like how to map your actions to your abstraction space. So like from this Z1 to this Z2 hat, okay, I performed the action A1. I need to know how to map between this latent space to this latent space using this action. And instead of predicting this latent space itself, I guess if we talk about like categorical values, maybe you can still do um, next latent space prediction because um, categorical values are quite like discrete. So I, I think it's okay to do this, that like you can probably do next like state prediction. So I haven't thought about this yet, but I think the easier way to do this is like given these two starting states, you do the action prediction. And if you can do the action prediction successfully, your states would probably be also mapped to the right representational space. Yeah, so all these are just some ideas that I have still working on it. My research is still ongoing for this. But um, my based on the grid world that I've been working on, my conclusion is that just prediction, just predicting action itself might already be good enough to form the representation. Yeah, of course, I'm willing to change my views if my experiments tell me otherwise. I'll let you know about this. Okay. Uh, but one thing I wanted to talk about world modeling is that I don't think we can like from here go to here. Like, yeah, this, this, no, I disagree with this. Uh, like, for example, if I move my hand forward, I'm not able to predict exactly where my hand would be in the pixel space, in, in the input space of my eyes. I can do that, but I can roughly tell you like it will get closer to the screen. You know, I, I will know that my, my hand is going closer, but I cannot predict for sure exactly where the hand would be. Yeah, so I, I always like to tell people who tell me that we operate on world models. I like to tell them, okay, I have a softball right now. I throw the softball at you. You have one second, okay? You see where the softball is. You have one second. You shut your eyes. Okay, if you can catch the softball after that, I would say that you have world model. You can predict the, like, the future in your head, yeah. You can try that. You ask someone to throw you a ball. You only see it for the first one second. You see whether you can catch the ball. Okay, how many of you here think you can catch the ball? Uh, raise your hands if you can catch. If you think you can catch the ball, your friend throws you a ball. You see it for one second. Can you catch the ball? Okay, so I have no response so far. What do you all think? Okay, Simon says no. All right, so I. I'm of the camp that no, you, you can't do that. Okay, unless you are like a trained athlete that already sees like different softball throws for your entire life. If not, just from the first one second, you don't have this world model to tell you, okay, next day is what, next day is what, next day is what. Sorry, do you do you mean like I see for one second when the ball is still stationary or what? Uh the first one second of the motion of the flight of the ball to you. I, I think that's doable. Okay. Uh, I mean, it, it really depends on how well trained you are, I guess. I mean, if you can do spot decently, it's doable. <laughs> yeah, but you will realize that although you can like, maybe even if you can predict the motion, it won't be of this form. Okay, it won't that, be of this form. that, I agree. Because uh, our planning is done in latent space, as you said. Mm, yeah. So, so maybe, yes, you can train yourself to predict the trajectory of the ball. Uh, but it will not be the same space as the, the actual yeah, space. Yeah. It cannot space. be. Yeah, I agree. It cannot be in pixel space. It's not possible. I don't think we think like we, we don't I don't think we uh plan or we reason based on like just the, the vanilla input from like what we receive from our uh I from our, our like optical image like information. But I, I don't even think we store it in pixel form. Yeah. yeah, but but I, I definitely agree with you. It, it can't be the, the the reasoning part cannot be done in the pixel space. Yes. Yeah, very good, very good. Yeah, so I I only buy half this architecture. Basically, I, I don't buy I don't buy this part here. But but the rest I think is okay. Yeah, this part of like how we predict the next state. Okay, perhaps what we do is like we instead of predicting next latent space, we predict the next action. Okay, my hypothesis is that. Just predicting the next action is something like the transformer next token prediction. You can already learn the embedding space of the tokens. Okay, okay. On this, on that, actually, I have some question. If not sure now, it's a probably time to oh, ask. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. What if so when you have some uh action that actually can map from one state to another, you can you can try to predict predict the action given your 
end state and your starting state. What if the state you have is a result of a sequence of action? Then you can't really do that, right? And if you want to predict that sequence of action, that's also combinatorial. So it's also going to be a very large um, space. It feels computationally expensive as well. Yeah, so I guess you are only limited to predicting only the next state. And then after yep. that, you need to do some form of planning whereby you like iteratively like perform actions in your head. Yeah, so so let's say uh, in one example you gave, I think earlier in your talk, uh, like when you want to go from somewhere to another place, how do you do the planning? For this case, you definitely need to do more than one action to a sequence of action to reach your terminal states. How, how are you going to do this plan? How are you yeah. going to do the actions? So, I mean, this is actually related to my fast and slow. So my fast and slow architecture is saying that you can just predict the first action and then you can then go all the way and predict all the way until your like last state. So let's, let's say, for example, your state one, state two, and state three. Uh, in the original fast and slow architecture is like that. You can do a prediction of like given state one and state three. I can then predict this action one. Okay, so this was the original like fast and slow architecture. And right now, like after like thinking through, and also what you said is right. Like if you have a cascade of actions, like how can you attribute your this change of state only to action one? I mean, why why can't you do action two first, right? Because it could work both ways, right? So I'm inclined to think now that maybe we don't do like first action prediction just like this, okay? But this can still form a rough compass. I like to call this as a compass. This can still form a right rough compass of where to go first because you can still roughly tell like, okay, it's maybe it's like go to the right first, okay? Um, or go down first. It doesn't really matter. As long as you go one of the right or down, you might reach stage three. Like you, you might go down and go right. Okay, you might still reach the end goal. So yeah, so so I think as long as you have a way to come up with your candidate intermediate state, then you can condition on those states to predict your action. So I'm curious, I'm interested in how do you come up with those yeah. intermediate states. So um this is also in fast and slow. So memory-based planning. You start with state one, you take like a random action in memory, and then you get a new state. And then you keep repeating until like you reach a goal state. So this memory-based planning will take into account the transitions you have learned before, and you would be like able to sort of construct the path from the start to the end. Oh, yeah. feels like you are doing some kind of search, right? Uh, yeah, it's more like, more like a, a, a Monte Carlo search, I guess, yeah? yeah. To, to form a path from the start to the end. Of course, yeah. it's not very efficient, so it needs to be improved. I see. So, so uh, I mean, definitely, uh, there are, you can just like uh, come, come with some efficient search method to map from your initial to end. Then you do, then given those intermediate state, then you do your prediction. Is it? Uh, uh, I mean, your prediction or action. So the prediction of action will always be done based on like the transition of your states, like state one, action one, state two, action two, state three, action three. So all uh, uh, this. Uh, will be used in a self-supervised way to do this next action prediction. So uh, you know the memory part. The memory part is separate. The memory part is for planning purposes. Of course. So with the search, the search step already give you this ground truth of this state sequence, state action sequence. Then yeah, you the do ground, the ground truth. If you take like state one and state three, or state one and state four, maybe you pump them into the like prediction architecture. And what you should get back, you should get back something like A1, which is like probably the first action you should do. So of course, this is a very aggregate action because you know there's a, a series of actions, but you will take the action that is most likely to get there based on like what you've experienced so far. Most so, likely. As in you, you do it multiple times, then you'll find the, the one that most frequently appeared. Yeah, I mean, the one that gives the action that most highest probability is likely the action that is the, the highest bias towards your goal. But you estimate the probability through sampling, right? Uh, you don't have to. This is something like next token prediction. Like that. You just have the softmax layer and then you can have the action tokens as your output and then you can get the various probabilities for each of the actions. 
Okay. okay. Yeah, first, your actions need to be some form of discrete manner, uh, discrete actions here. If not, you can't do the probabilities. Okay. Yeah. So I think this, uh, I mean, what I does describe here is fast and slow. Uh, and the upgrade of this fast and slow is that if you just get the action here, you can potentially get the embedding space for your states as well. So this is this is something that I'm still thinking about because like I'm thinking you can learn the state representation here. But on the other hand, after you learn the state representation, in order to put into your memory, your state needs to be fixed. So so <laughs> there's a slight error, there's a slight dichotomy here. Like you have to, so for the learning of um, learning of state embeddings or state and action or like abstractions state action embeddings you can allow embeddings to change okay let me just see whether i got space here but for extraction of learn state of learn abstraction it should be fixed yeah, so if you were to use the like states and actions that you learn for planning, uh, my hypothesis is that your embedding space needs to be fixed. If not, you cannot do planning. Like you can't do planning when your earlier memories have been like corrupted already. If you change your embedding space, so there needs to be a cutoff whereby you fix the embedding space and you don't change anymore. Yeah, I'm not sure whether this part makes sense, but. If you were to use like the learned um, embedding space of your states for planning, like what you see over here, like this state one, this state one is not the actual input state, you know, this state one is the abstract state, like this, this state here. So if you were to change this thing halfway, then what is your state one in your memory? It will be different already. It will be mapping to a different kind of uh, object or a different kind of initial state. So you can't change the mapping. You see, if you were to do this memory based planning, you can't change the mapping. But over here, when they did Dreamer, they didn't do a memory-based uh, planning. They just simply take the, the, the current state, okay, map into a latent space, and then they just do prediction in the latent space like that using a neural network. So there's no memory here. Yeah, but if you were to do memory-based planning, you need to you need to fix this. You need to fix this embedding here. If not, you will have problems referring to your memory. Okay, yeah, Let, let's move on. If, if any, any questions, you can ask again next week. Okay, it's quite late already. I'll just talk about fixed biases and then we talk about the hierarchical part next week. Okay, because the hierarchical part, I will spend a bit more time talking about it. Yeah, because I believe uh, the hierarchy is perhaps why transformers can work so well. Okay, so it can capture hierarchies of representations, not just the like one 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 step you can do representation or representation or representation. All right, let, let's just talk about uh, natural fixed bias first. So this is related to like the world model that you saw earlier over here. You see the way we actually process this into latent space like that, it could be learnable or it also could be fixed. Okay, what does it mean by fixed? Okay, if we look at the year, all right, the year, this is the cochlea of the year. And as you Go through the cochlea, you have cilia that vibrates at different frequencies. So if you think about it, our ear actually performs Fourier transform for you naturally. Just by the movement of your cilia, you know what frequency enters your ear. Okay, And also these are the human audible frequencies by nature of the design. So you cannot hear sounds that are beyond the frequencies that your cochlea can hear. Right? Same thing for vision. Vision, you have local patches of red, green, blue for your cones, for your lights, and then for your rods, it's either detect that there's some light at night or there's no light at all. So it's either black or white. So all this means that vision is highly localized. Okay, um, the cones, the red, green, and blue give you biases for the different colors and the rocks give you biases for like night vision. So all this means that you don't have to learn what's a red, what's a green, what's a blue. It's all given to you. And there's a huge benefit to that. So if you know about information theory, like the amount of information we have in the world is like sort of infinite. And if you want to distill the information, okay, so I may just draw to your channel. Okay, so this is how like a channel works. Like you have, a, you have an input signal and then you pass through a channel. 
and then you get some output. Okay, if we are just looking at this output alone, all right, without any bias, okay, imagine if you have infinite possible, infinitely possible x, you also have infinitely, infinitely many possible y's. And how is it that you know which y should you, like what should you learn from, from this like stimuli? Okay, in order for you to learn well, okay, or like to sort of like decode in, in the communication channel sense, you sort of need to use a code book. So like the, like for example, if you get the data stream of maybe like 01010, right? And then your code book tells you like, okay, 01 stands for A, all right? And, zero stands for maybe B, then you can actually decode 01010 into like A, A, B. Okay, if not, if you don't have this code book here to help you decode, right, you will have a problem understanding, like if let's say you receive like 010101, oh, sorry, 01010 at the end part, which is like at the Y here, there's, there's infinitely many possible ways to interpret what this is. Like it could be zero one zero then one zero. It could be zero one zero one then zero, or maybe even the zero could be split into subparts and so on. Yeah, there could be many many possible um, ways of interpreting this. If you don't have any like code book to help you to dissect like what is the way to interpret the data. So like for example, if you don't have these frequencies here, the the sound we hear will be like in in the time domain, which is very very hard to interpret. But because we can convert them into frequencies in the cochlea, the frequency domain is much neater and cleaner. So these are just some of the biases we have when we do some form of processing, like for audio. For vision, we have the rods and cones to help us do the processing. If we don't do that, uh, imagine if we have like what we see in the pixel space, red, green, blue, and like maybe transparency. If we don't have these local patches, we need to do by pixels one by one you will have a lot of like things to represent. And uh, that's why I don't agree like vision should be represented by pixels, just too much, too many things. Uh, and you, even if you represent by rods and cones, there's also too many things to represent because like there's so many rods and so many cones in the eye. How do you represent that? So, um, but, but, but the point for this slide is saying that for vision and for sound, uh, for audio, you actually learn with some form of constraints with what you experience. So you don't experience the whole wavelength. You don't experience infrared. You don't experience uh, ultraviolet. Yeah, I don't think you see ultra. Yeah, you don't see ultraviolet. So these are some of the things that constrain what we perceive. And because of that, we are able to interpret the signals better because like it's like the way of like giving you a code book to sort of like dissect this into like, okay, instead of interpreting it this way, I can interpret it as AAB, then I can process using AAB instead of processing using the, the 010101. So in some sense, this code book gives you semantic meaning. It, because of the way you quantify your code book or the way you quantify your sound as frequencies, the way you quantify your colors as like uh, vision as red, green, blue, it gives meaning to red, it gives meaning to green, it gives meaning to blue. The same thing, it gives meaning to frequencies. Okay, I mean, It'll kind of blow your mind if I tell you that, like, if our ears didn't hear by frequencies, we probably wouldn't have the piano because, like, the piano is based on frequencies, like, our music instruments is based on frequencies. It matches what we hear. Okay, you 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 don't hear like, like those kind of. I mean that that is also frequency, but that is not what our ears are designed to to hear. Like all those uh noise, yeah, we are not designed to hear that. Same thing for color. You don't see infrared. You don't see ultraviolet. So because of that, you don't have any semantic meaning attached to this kind of vision. Like you, you see an infrared like um, picture before, like for firemen, they use infrared to see like where are the heat sources. It actually takes a bit of training to understand what this heat source stands for. I mean, what the bright patches stand for. It takes a bit of training because we don't naturally perceive things that way. We don't have semantic meaning for those kind of infrared sources. What our natural fixed biases give us it gives us faster learning by constraints. And at the same time, it also gives us semantic meaning based on the constraints, yeah, which is quite cool because it means that all of our perception right now 
is all based on what we can perceive. And we attach semantic meaning to what we can perceive. So it, it's some form of constraint, and yet at the same time, it also gives the meaning. So yeah, it's, it's a dual agent thing. Like how, how I put it. A another way for this kind of natural fixed bias, maybe you think of a transformer, is the tokenization. So if you tokenize differently, you tokenize different words differently, you will get different semantic meaning by different tokens. So this um, different semantic meaning by different tokens, this is something that I think is still under like research, but I mean, if you're using stuff like byte pair encoding, you get a different kind of way to interpret your, your words as compared to if you do by character level tokenization, because you know, character level tokenization, you don't get much meaning on the characters. You need to go from like subwords or words and so on. So the way we do this kind of bias of processing our data or processing natural input, this kind of different biases will lead us to process things in different meanings. And some of these biases may be good, some may be bad, but humans, we are all born with some form of fixed bias and that speeds up our learning while at the same time also makes us unable to learn certain things, like unable to learn how to like interpret the infrared spectrum, for example. Yeah, so, so this is um, this is a double agent sword. Like you have fixed biases, you learn faster. Okay, but at the same time, your semantic meaning is constrained by these fixed biases. And yeah, this is like something like what I share about the, this code book. Like because you are given this code book, you interpret this signal as A and B. Okay, you don't see a C here because the code book doesn't specify a C. So you might miss out on like certain things that you could otherwise have seen. Like I believe like the Manta Ray or something has like, you can see 25 different kinds of colors. I think that was in uh, Stephen Wolfram's recent podcast with Lex Friedman. He, he mentioned something like that. So we don't have this color, um, like as many as 25 colors as the Manta Ray. We miss out on learning this kind of colors and their semantic meaning associated with it. But we are very good at red, green, and blue because we see it, it's structured in our cones. Uh, yeah, in our cones here. So if you link back to this, this part here might be the natural fixed bias. bias. Yeah, in the Japa architecture, this part, this encoder might be your natural fixed bias. Okay, of course, there might be some learning. Done. So the natural fixed bias might be here. So I just call it FB, fixed bias, not Facebook, fixed bias. So after the fixed bias is applied, you then maybe can do some form of learning to do the mapping to the encoding space, which I believe must be fixed after a while. If not, you cannot use memory. So, um, all right. So this is just an illustration of how we do like frequency modeling in the Fourier transform, like a sound wave you split into frequency domain. Uh, what could be very jumbled up like that, you can split into two waves, one with a low frequency and one with a high frequency, you do into a frequency domain. This is like what the cilia here, like two different frequency picks, all right? And you can then split like your signal for audio into different like, like chunks here. And you can then like model the sound wave as different frequency chunks. So this works quite well for traditional like codec systems. Of course, like the most recent and codec, they also do like some form of time-based modeling. Yeah, so it starts to seem to me that the natural fixed biases um, may be helpful, but it also can constrain what is possible. Because if you do by the bias like this, you convert from audio to uh, frequency. If you want to convert back to audio again, like what you see in images, if you want to convert this back into this, this messy audio here, like, 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 like that, Okay, the fixed bias may not reconstruct perfectly because why you already miss out on some signals. Like if you miss out on the high frequency and the low frequency, like our ears, you can't reconstruct that part again because we don't hear it. The fixed bias will constrain what we hear. And at the same time, it also means that we cannot interpret it back um, to the original signal that we, that, that we have heard. So if you want to do reconstruction loss, Fixed bias is bad. But I'm saying that for most prediction problems, you don't have to reconstruct. You can just predict in the latent space. So the fixed bias will be good enough. So let's go to the next slide where I talk more about, okay, so this is, uh, sorry, this is about vision. 
So vision, the, the focus of how the cones are, you know, the focal patch of the cones is quite nicely embedded in like CNN filters because like you then focus on each of these patches like independently. And the way you process this is the same. So this means that the fixed embedding space is learned already. So this is already learned how to like embed your input, how to interpret your input well. Okay, so this uh, might be learnable, might be fixed. I'm more tempted to think that it's fixed, okay? But, but yeah, I mean, a lot of people would um, push back on that, saying filters should be learnable. I, I'm, I have a feeling that it's already fixed. Or, or it could be learnable in the first few years, but it's fixed after that. Because you need a way to store your image in the memory form, and that memory cannot change, or cannot change that, that rapidly, because you still need to use it for planning. So this must be fixed. Or must most, like, most likely be fixed after a while. So um, this is where I'd like to end that. Um, so this is basically what uh, I've been talking about. You have an input. You go into a latent space by going to some fixed fix bias. All right. And then you can then do your processing in your abstraction space. We can call this abstraction space. So most of the time, we just need to do an abstraction space here. And then your output here will just be your action needed. All right, in, in LLMs, the action will be the next token. In embodied agents, the action will be the movement of the embodied agents. Yeah, after you do your process, processing in the abstraction space, if you so need to, you can also reconstruct. But I think this part here is, um, is artificial. Like We don't exactly need to do this when we are doing... Uh, I, I, I don't think we need to reconstruct at all Like when we do decision-making. But if you are doing some form of like computer applications where you want to do segmentation, then no choice, you need to reconstruct. But um, this will probably, the loss will not be, will not be like the next token loss here. So this next token loss is in the processing here. Self-supervised loss, which is good. Yeah, but if you want to do like the reconstruction loss here, this is not natural. It's not, I, I don't believe this is natural for humans. So, uh, this main slide, this whole slide, the main focus of what I want to say is that this fixed bias is very important for learning. It gives us the semantic meaning needed for your rep representing the input. But at the same time, with the fixed bias, we kind of suck at doing the, the reverse, which is the reconstruction, because you lose out the information already. You lose out information, and if you try to reconstruct that, it will be a lossy representation. I mean, that might be the reason why dreams are so hazy. Like, you can't see things clearly. At least for human faces, I'm not able to visualize faces clearly in my dreams. And that may be the reason of a fixed bias. It's already stored in a different form. You have to reconstruct back. You can't get the picture perfect way of getting your, your face again. Yeah. So, I mean, that's it. Stuff like stable diffusion may not be natural at all to humans. Yeah. So by, by saying all this, you know, you look at the latest wave of innovations in images. A lot of them are probably not natural to how the brain works. Uh, if you if, if you buy what I'm I'm trying to tell you here, like that we don't reconstruct. Okay, so uh, actually that's all for today. I think I exceeded time a bit. Um, next week we can continue more on this because I let me just show you briefly the slides. Hierarchical prediction. Okay, and like how can transformers possibly do hierarchical generation? So we can continue on, on, on this next week. And I can also talk a bit of like how I do prompt engineering for some of my games. All right, so let's continue this uh, uh, next week. But before that, let's just talk about one of the questions. All right, that I think is quite interesting. Uh, we can just talk about this, this first two because these are related to what we have talked about today. So yeah, is our embedding space a fixed one? Like to get into the abstraction space, is it a fixed one from the fixed bias? Or is it like from experience and is learnable? Or you can be both. Yeah. Well, what, what, what do you think about it? What, what do you mean by our embedding space? Can I give you an example? Oh, okay. Like for example, for images that uh, like your vision, what you see, um, like for example, you see a room here. And then when you process the room itself, you store it in some like space for like maybe in a in memory. All right. So if you were to retrieve things of the room from memory, you may not remember like all the details of the room. So like how do we get this 
abstraction space in the form of like the memory that you remember? Like, is it based on natural biases of like how we interpret objects or is it learned from experience into how to predict? Like, for example, I'm just trying to say like, okay, let's say for example, we have this like filters here. Is this filters like fixed from birth or is it learnable or is it both? I think to a very large extent, it should be, it should depend depends on how our brain works. So I, I tend to say it's uh, to a very large extent it's fixed. Mm -hmm. It's flexible in the sense that I believe that during the retrieval of memory, we have the freedom to focus our attention on certain parts. So it's not just when we remember we uh, at a point when we like uh, add all those things into our memory we we might have paid pay attention to a certain part. I think that's maybe that's the learnable part. But even during retrieval, we also can like select the important information mm. from memory. Yeah, I mean that that's uh, an interesting point. You can actually interpret your memory in different ways if you like prompt it differently, I guess, <laughs> or you or you condition it differently for generation, uh, for retrieval. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of storing of memory, I think you you have the view that uh, most of like how you encode it in the memory is fixed, and uh, yeah, I think that's that's the view that I have as well. Although I do have a little caveat that you can probably learn some stuff, like. You can probably learn how to store things based on self-supervised learning. I, I agree. That's that's why they have all these different, like you see on on YouTube, that different. Like there's some content creator teach you how to do do to get better grade by doing some using some learning strategy, right? If I mean, if that's legit strategy, then that kind of implies there are different ways of uh, doing memorizations. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So I I think the answer is both. Yeah, but any other views before I move on to the next question? Okay, so the next part. Okay, should we do prediction whereby we map back into input space? Okay, like for example, reconstruction of the image, or should we just do prediction in the latent space? All right. So uh, maybe I talk about my views before I ask for inputs. So my view is that uh, we actually do the prediction only in the latent space. Because that is what is really needed for decision making. You don't have to reconstruct the original world again, right? Uh, of course, the benefit is that you can do decision making on a on a more abstract form. Do decision making in abstract in abstraction space helps with generalization because uh, you are able to generalize to more and more like uh, similar situations. Okay, but the drawback is unable to remember exactly stuff. And able to like do uh like what, what happened yeah so so you can so there's some drawbacks we are not cassette tapes or video recorders or you know like we don't remember our life exactly but we can generalize quite well because we don't remember very well yeah so we plan everything in latent space and I believe this latent space or this abstraction space is also how we store our memories okay, yeah uh, you're open for uh any comments now. I wouldn't say I completely agree with uh, your comment. Um, because we don't memorize exactly, we tend to generalize better. I, I don't think that's not necessarily the case. Okay. But they are, I don't think they are conflicting each other. You can have perfect memory, but you choose to uh, just extract the principal things you learn from th those memory and apply it to other things, right? It's really up to you. Mm, but would you say that you don't yeah. remember things exactly and because of that, you don't yeah. necessarily have a separate memory for for like maybe the same object? Uh, what, what, what do you mean? Like for example, if you look at this cup here, if uh -huh. I were to tilt the cup slightly like that, you would still treat it as the same cup. Like because like you don't remember like the orientation of the cup perfectly. To you, it's just a cup. So yeah. So because of that, you lose out on some memory of like the orientation, but you gain on generalization because you can interpret how the cup interacts. Oh, okay. 
so my, my take on that is you choose you can't you have the free you have the degree of freedom to choose what kind of information you want to memorize. So in this case, uh, I think by default, I wouldn't, at least for me, I wouldn't pay too much attention on the orientation unless you prompt me to do so. So if you just present a cup to, a mark to me, I, I, I would say like the, the information I I choose to put into my memory is like the object itself rather than its orientation or positioning or whatever. But if I if I choose, if I conscious make the conscious choice to choose to memorize the orientation, I certainly can do so. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. It, it means that you can actually cue yourself to remember things um if you if you will if you will yourself to do it. Yeah. Yeah, but that also means that you also lose out information in the stuff that you don't will yourself to do. Like if you focus your attention on one part of the picture, you lose out the overall picture. I, I would say this, like maybe by default, there's a certain threshold of capacity we usually have to do memorization. So, so by default, I wouldn't try to put so much information into my memory. Like yeah. based on my experiences or based on some in inductive bias, I, I tend to pay more attention to certain property. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but I, I think you also agree that like the like to map back, right? For example, if you memorize a picture, there's no need to be a to have picture perfect memory in order to do your daily life. Like you don't have to memorize every scene you have seen with yeah. Like, yes, I agree. But but more but more than that, I also think this latent space is very uh, flexible or malleable. It really depend, depend on the context. Like in some, for some tasks, for different tasks, for the same input, your latent space might vary, right? Uh, for the same input, your latent space might, uh, hopefully not, <laughs> because then it means your latent space is encoded wrongly. Oh uh, no, for different tasks. Oh, for different tasks, yes. Yeah. This latent space likely will have different um, uh, different learn stuff for different kinds of uh, objectives because like to pick up a cup and to like maybe to I don't know to to draw a cup maybe are different skills yeah uh, sometimes you can even force your latent space to be the pixel space I mean if you choose to do so but it really depends on the context I think if you are trying to train yourself to replicate an image then yes your latent yeah. space would be the input space yeah but then also your memory the way you memorize things also change, right? Yeah. Uh, according to the context and the task you are interested in. And, yeah. Right, correct. Yeah. You know, have you tried this uh, memory test before? Like, you remember a list of 10 objects. Then you have to force yourself to remember the 10 objects. And it's actually quite tough because we can only remember like chunks of four to seven. Yeah. So I could do the 10 objects, one, but with great difficulty, you need to imagine the sequence of objects and so on. So I can imagine that, like, it is. It may be humanly possible to memorize the entire input space. It may be humanly possible. Uh, it may be humanly possible. Not, it's not efficient. Yeah, but it, it takes up too much memory. Yeah, it's not efficient for too much. Like I also saw some like video says last like uh, there's one person can memorize the, I think to some I hundred or thousand digits of pi. Yeah. yeah. But but then you need to of course like train yourself to do that. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not natural. Mm. So maybe the 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 drawback for this is like the drawback is you will need more memory capacity and uh and also processing capacity. Yeah, so basically we can tune ourselves based on the task to come as the most efficient latent space, right? Yeah. Yeah, actually that's a very interesting point. Like is the latent space task dependent yeah so i i do think it is task dependent but how does the brain do it then like like if you look at transformers the latent space can change based on the context like if you talk about a prompt right this is like your prompts so you can have like a background context and then you can have the original prompt itself so like how you process the prompt might change based on the background context you give it like for example your background context is do the opposite like um at um, John did not, or uh, John went to the supermarket. So, so this means that John actually did not go to the supermarket. So um, this 
could be like sort of some form of task dependent um, background. And it's able to, using this background, affect the latent space of the prompt itself. So I quite like transformers and the next token prediction because I think this task dependent latent space might just be a case of specifying the task at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, people have done decision transformers, so they have um, basically just specified, like, I don't know, just some tasks that you need to do. Oh, actually, no, they haven't done it before, but I have done it before with GPT. I specify some tasks that you have, you want it to do, and it's able to do the task by just specifying that as the context. So I'm not too sure whether it influenced the latent space. I believe it does, because this part here will need to be like influenced by the front, front part. Yeah. But if, if let's say we can use transformers to already do this kind of latent space um, mapping to the task, I think that's a very, very powerful technique. So I, I guess then, um, actually it's less fixed, right? Yeah, the latent space can be, oh, oh, actually you make a good point here. It means that the latent space is dynamic based on the task. Yeah, it seems so. But then in that case, how do we store the memory? Do we store different memories for different tasks? Mm. Uh. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you see the dilemma here, right? In order to extract memory out correctly, you need to fix your memory representation. If not, the memory might not be like applicable for the, the task. But if you were to do that, means that you need to have very, very fixed memories. But okay. The uh, fact is, we are able to like sort of map our memories to you. Kind of, you kind of automatically know like what kind of form of memory it is. Then you can use it correctly, rather than instead of mapping it to the wrong latent space. Mm -hmm. So actually, we may be able to do like if we store a memory like that. If we store a memory like this, we might be able to base on the task condition. We might be able to map the memory to the right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, so if, this, if, even the context, then you know. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we can sort of reuse memories across different tasks because we can just take this memory, maybe like pass it through some like transformer layer or something, and you can get the final like context by just changing the conditioning. Yeah, maybe that's done like that. Like when you store memories, it could be stored in a neutral way, maybe. Yeah, and then you just yeah. input the task to condition it. Yeah, but, but that's a very, very good point because if, if memory can be is that malleable, then how can we still retain like a fixed memory? So that's something that I need to think about. Yeah. I, I don't understand. What do you mean by Yeah, no, so like, because I always believe like the way you store this memory is fixed. Okay, but if we were to like be able to change your memory to fit different tasks, like the representation for task one and task two is different, you can form different memories just by conditioning on some tasks. Then this sort of questions the like whether or not memory is really that fixed. Yeah. I'm not too sure about this. I need to think more about this. Like it seems to be that your memory can be manipulated to fit certain tasks. But you can just store it. Maybe you can store it as one task and then you can just convert to another task after that. Yeah, but that means when what you store, right? Maybe just like sequences of words like that. If you if you're at the yeah. beginning when you do memorization, if you store enough information, you can late uh later time can always convert to the one you like you suit for your task. But then you must have all the information up front. Yeah. So but, but then if you only you if you only just like just now in the example, if I only remember it somewhat, but at the point in time I didn't try to memorize the the orientation, then in a later time, I cannot recall. Yeah, correct. If you don't memorize it in the beginning, you can't shift your latent space to memorize stuff that you don't even remember. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a constraint to that. But if you were talk about like different tasks, different things, maybe the way, you know, like for example, the interactive simulator, they store things by, by text, right? Maybe this way of storing memory as text, right? Can I really do this malleability? Like, Given this text, you just need to append this memory with some form of header, like um, give me what this person is feeling at this time, or give me like what the person would do next. 
maybe storing memory as text like that, this could be the abstraction space. Could, could this be the abstraction space? Because this is very generic, right? You just store everything as text like that. You only store actually the embeddings. And you can actually use self-attention to change the embedding space. Right? I'm not sure if it's really uh, stored as in the form of text. In this case, because some I feel some some uh, later a uh, form of memory is quite abstract. It's like it's even more abstract than text. The yeah, natural yeah, right. like like for example, motion you don't store in text. You store as like maybe sequences yeah. of impulses. And your memory. like your skills to play instrument. Yeah, it's muscle. It's in the form of muscle memory. Mm. There are different kinds of memory. Some higher order planning. I think text may be the right approach. The lower level processes might be a different way, maybe some form of embeddings. Yeah, but it's quite interesting that you can then do some form of like, um, you can then tweak the embeddings according to context. And this part must be factored in in the memory um, retrieval mechanism because I can imagine myself doing that. I can I can distort my memory just by conditioning on some context. Like the, the image, like when you talk, when you give question, the image I have in my mind is. You know, in those de de dark, de dark, uh, detective novel, right? They initially they have all the evidence, but then they couldn't figure out any any lead. But later on, when they just re re uh review all the like go through all the all the all the evidence in their memory, they realize, oh, actually, this is something very suspicious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can also continuously reflect and store new memories. Actually, that sounds a lot like this. Uh, the Simlaka paper. They also have the reflection and they storm. Sorry, this one. Yeah, they might be doing quite a lot of things that are correct in this paper. Okay, yeah, but but I agree with you. I agree with you. There's there's probably different ways to store memory, and I think it could be different kinds of latent space for different kinds of tasks, and not just that. It might also be hierarchical in nature. So uh, that part, the hierarchy part. Um, we can talk more next week because I do have quite a, a lot of slides on that. I don't think I have time to cover it today. Yeah. Okay, maybe we just uh, check. Right? You have anything else you want to say? If not, we can end for today already. No, that's, no I don't have anything else. Yeah, yeah but thanks, thanks for that discussion. I think it's very helpful because I'm still thinking about how to represent memory. It's not, it's not fixed yet. What I have in mind is just my idea and I'm still, I'm still refining it. So yeah, don't worry, I'll, I'll credit you in the memory paper that I'm about to write. <laughs> okay, yeah, if not, I will end here. Uh, next week, we'll talk more about how, like, how we can represent in a hierarchical space and like how transformers might actually perform hierarchical generation. So we'll talk about this next week. Okay, and uh, that's it. And see ya.